Race for the Poles, Part 3, a little epilogue about some other things connected to the North and South Poles. First up, the worst journey in the world. And no, not Captain Scott's. This is the story of the man who, out of everyone who didn't end up dead, probably had the worst experience during the whole South Pole Expedition race thing. The amazingly named Apsley Cherry Gerard was a rich young Englishman who had a mutual friend with Captain Scott and Uncle Bill Wilson. Uncle Bill was a nickname. Gerard believed in what they were there to do, to get to the pole and do as much science as they could, so asked Bill to put a word for him in with Scott. Gerard, though, had no useful skills and so was turned down, but he still believed in what they were doing, so accepted and cut them a check. Scott was so moved that he told Gerard that he could come along and they would find something for him to do. After they got to Antarctica, they were busy with preparations for the attempt on the pole and the occasional bit of science. Now, Bill was an ornithologist who believed that studying penguin embryos might give useful information about bird evolution from dinosaurs. He'd previously been to the penguin breeding grounds of Cape Crozier. Yes, named for that Crozier. He'd been there and got some chicks, but they were too old to be of use. This time, he intended to get eggs. He asked Gerard and Bertie Bowers to accompany him on his journey to Cape Crozier. Now, the last time he was in Antarctica, he went during the Antarctic summer. But now, they were three weeks' walk from it and it's the middle of the Antarctic winter. Meaning, 24 hours of darkness and some of the coldest temperatures human beings have ever lived in. On the best of days, minus 40 centigrade or minus 40 Fahrenheit. On the worst, minus 80 centigrade or minus 112 Fahrenheit. But they went all the same, not even dressed in Inuit-style skins. No sled dogs, just three men pulling two sledges of supplies day after day. To make things worse, they were asked to eat different mixtures of supplies, so when they returned, the effects on their bodies could be measured. Effects like scurvy. Why? They were trying to work out the ideal mix of supplies for the long walk to the pole. In a way, they had problems with the sledges, they can only pull one at a time. So they would have to walk a mile, leave the sledge, go back a mile, get the other one and bring it to where the first one was. For every mile travel, they walked three. It was so cold that once Gerard left the tent, looked around and his clothes froze, leaving him staring at the sky for the next four hours while manhauling. It was so cold that a warmish meal would hit their system like a drug, that the liquid inside blisters would freeze solid. At Cape Crozier, they built a stone igloo, the remains of which are still there. They then lost the roof, the tent. It blew away in a blizzard and they put their heads down and waited for death. 36 hours later, under piles of snow, they awoke and couldn't believe their luck. The tent was still nearby. They went down to the rookery and collected the necessary eggs. On the return journey, Gerard's was broken. By the time they got back to base camp, six weeks had passed. Gerard had lost most of his teeth to scurvy and a few were shattered because of the chattering. He also lost most of his sight. Not that he had lots to begin with. Months later, when the effort for the pole started, Gerard was one of many men assigned to support it. An unglamorous, but necessary job. When Scott and his team were due back, Gerard was sent to the final supply depot to render assistance. He travelled with dogs, but here's the problem. There was no dog food included at the depot, so he couldn't feed them. Normally, the thing to do would be to kill some of the dogs and feed the others, but Gerard was told by a superior back at base that Scott had left instructions not to harm the dogs as they needed next year. So Gerard had the choice to disobey and continue on and try to find Scott, or stay as long as he could before returning to base. He did the latter. He didn't know that Scott was in trouble or how close he was. Three days travel. He returned to base after a week's wait. By the time another mission was prepared, Scott was already dead. What makes it even worse is that Scott's orders might not have even happened. If they did, they were not in writing. In a way, that decision would haunt him for the rest of his days. He was kind of blamed for what happened to Scott. He definitely blamed himself. He developed severe PTSD. His mind and body were irreparably damaged by his experiences in Antarctica. But we're not done yet. Among Scott's final team were his friend Uncle Bill and Bertie Bowers, the other man he'd spent six weeks in frozen hell with. He had a mean case of survivor's guilt. And then, when he got back home to England, he took the penguin eggs to the Natural History Museum only to be informed that not only were the eggs from too late in the season, but the whole theory that Uncle Bill was working from was in the middle of being debunked. It was all for naught. Apsley Cherry Gerard wrote The Worst Journey in the World about his experiences in Antarctica, and I'll let him sum it up. Polar exploration is at once the cleanest and most isolated way of having a bad time 
which has been devised. On the plus side, the success of the book means the eggs brought back are now on display in the Natural History Museum in London. Fun trivia though, three people, to my knowledge, have played Gerard on screen. One, Mark Gatiss, writer and actor for New Who. Two, Barry Letts, producer of Classic Who between series 7 and 11. And three, Hugh Grant, who played the Doctor in a bit of comedy nonsense. Now, the other epilogue, The Wreck of the Italia. In the 1920s, the airship Italia was used for voyages to the North Pole for science reasons, and one fateful trip in 1928, on the 25th of May, it crashed into the ice on its return journey. Why did it crash? Severe weather was at least part of it. The ship broke into several pieces. The main section, the gondola, crashed, and the envelope, the balloon itself, flew away, never to be seen again. There were eight survivors in the gondola, along with a dog belonging to Umberto Nobile, the expedition leader and pilot. There were six still in the envelope who disappeared into the sky. There were some supplies, and they were able to transmit an SOS, but it would take until the 12th of July for all the survivors to be rescued, including the dog. Polar rescues are tricky at the best of times, and the crash had happened on the pack, the floating sea ice that constantly moves, and it was taking them away from their home base and towards the remote parts of Russia. Many of the survivors had severe injuries, broken bones and such, and while they were all dressed for the cold, no one had polar gear with them. They were dressed for a cold air trip, not living on the ice. On the 30th of May, long before a rescue was mooted, three men, Finn Malmgren, Filippo Zappi and Adalberto Mariano, decided to walk to Svalbard for help. Just over two weeks later, Malmgren collapsed and told the others to leave him, and they did. Almost a month later, the other two were rescued. What happened to Malmgren is a matter of some controversy. Did it happen like the other two said? Did they abandon him? Did they cannibalize him? We don't know, but the accusations have been made. The rescue of the survivors of the Italia was an international effort, with Italy, Sweden, Russia, Norway, Denmark, the USA, and Finland taking part. The rescuers came by land, air, and sea. Among them was Roel Amundsen. Amundsen was the man who sat at the use of polar airships, having had trouble with more traditional planes near the pole. He commissioned Umberto Nobile to design the first, the Norgay, and had been in charge of its first successful use in 1926, but he'd stepped away from the project due to his hatred of the nationalistic Nobile and retired. Without Amundsen, Nobile created a new ship for missions to the Pole. The Italia, slightly larger than the Norgay, and five missions to the Pole were planned. They would not all happen. When Amundsen heard about the disaster, he immediately took a prototype seaplane to help with the rescue efforts, and on the 18th of June, he vanished with five other men. It's believed that they crashed in heavy fog into the frozen Barents Sea and died in impact, or hopefully soon after. No sign of them has ever been found. Amundsen died searching for a man he despised. There is an alternate theory, though, from Karen May and George Lewis, much less popular, but worth mentioning. Amundsen was suffering from cancer, he made some errors, didn't tell anyone exactly where he was going, and refused an escort. The theory is that it was possibly suicide. Was it a moment of tragic heroism from an arrogant old man, or something worse? I don't know. I hope it was the first one. There is a very dark sort of poetry that Amundsen is entombed somewhere near the roof of the world, so close to the pole that he wanted to conquer, while Scott is buried under the ice near the South Pole. Both men denied their dreams, but buried there all the same. The story of the Italia was dramatized in a great little film called The Red Tent in the late 60s. It's named after the tent the survivors huddled in for those two months. Like the actual rescue, it was an international effort, produced by Italy and the USSR, and it featured Sean Connery as Amundsen. So, next time, who wants to hear about the Swedes in the 19th century who tried to fly over the North Pole in a balloon?